Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks for listening. Even if you're watching, maybe you're listening with your eyes. Thanks to all of you, including Mark Gibson, Reed Fischler, Larry Bailey, and James Irizarry. On this episode of DTNS, the new app model is no ads, monetized with premium features, and don't use algorithms. Plus, Google Meet lets you use your phone, even if you're at the meeting in person, and NVIDIA's new AI for your local PC. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, February 13th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. And sometimes we all come together to form Daily Tech News Show, like a like a mecca, right? A Voltron a of a trifecta of excellence, I like to say. Mm, like know. a triforce. Yeah. yeah. yeah not like to it. toot our own horn too much, but we're kind of good at this. We should <laughs> toot our horn a little more. We're a link to the uh to the tech news. A link to the tech news, indeed. <laughs> all right, let's start with the quick hits. Regulators in the European Union have decided that Apple won't have to make iMessage interoperable with other iMessaging platforms, messaging platforms rather. Microsoft also won't face tighter controls on how it can operate its search engine Bing. The European Commission concluded the services aren't popular enough to count as core platform services under the DMA or Digital Markets Act. The commission also gave Microsoft's Edge browser and Microsoft advertising a pass. Apple says it will still support RCS on iMessage message later this year sick burn eu oh sorry you're not popular enough yeah, you to like comply not that big a deal. the flipper zero is a digital multi-tool that's popular with pen testers and other kinds of hackers uh partnership with raspberry pi has produced a video game module that can run games programmed in c c plus plus and micro python uh, the module also has sensors for hand tracking, a three-axis gyroscope, and a three-axis accelerometer. Now, yes, you can play the games on the built-in 1.4-inch monochrome display on the Flipper Zero, uh, but you can also output the video to an external display. The video game module costs 49 bucks. The Flipper Zero itself, if you didn't already have one, costs 169 bucks. And in other small ways to play games news. The Playdate handheld console is now available for immediate shipment after ordering. If you were waiting for that uh, delay to come down, well, it came down. Rumor has it that Microsoft plans to take Xbox exclusive titles to competing platforms, including the PlayStation 5 and the Nintendo Switch. The company plans to share its Xbox vision for the future of Xbox on a live podcast Thursday, February 15th at 12 p.m. Pacific time at 3 p.m. Eastern. The event comes after weeks and weeks, it seems like, of rumors Months. suggesting games like Hi-Fi Rush, Sea of Thieves, Starfield, Indiana Jones could all appear on non-Xbox platforms for the first time. Microsoft has confirmed gaming CEO Phil Spencer, Xbox president Sarah Bond, and head of Xbox Studios Matt Booty will all share updates on the Xbox business at this Thursday event. On Booty and Spencer. Uh, for those chat GPT power users tired of reminding the chatbot how they like their emails formatted every time they ask for help or, or other stuff like that, OpenAI is introducing a feature called Memory. The feature lets ChatGPT remember things about you over a time. Now, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can tell it specifically, hey, remember to do this. Or you can let it pick the details up itself and remember them as it monitors what you do. Each GPT you use can have its own memory. So if you've been using some of the chat bots from the store, they can have specific memories. And you can ask the bot what it knows about you too, if you let it learn on its own, just to make sure it's not, you know, keeping some stuff you don't want it to keep. Uh, and you can actually remove that stuff either by telling it to remove it or going to the manage memory section. Uh, memory is not rolled out for everybody though. It's available to begin with for a small portion of users. Along with putting ad-free Amazon Prime Video content behind a paywall that charges users an additional $2.99 per month, Amazon put support for Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos on movies and TV shows that support it behind that paywall as well. Some folks were not super thrilled about this. The change was first noticed by the German website 4K Film and later confirmed to Forbes. I call this uh, shrinkflation for digital video. 
slowly take away features, but don't raise your price. All right. Uh, <laughs> NVIDIA released a demo chat bot called Chat with RTX. It runs locally, not in the cloud, uh, and can answer questions about the data you give it. You'll need Windows. Uh, you'll need a machine with an RTX 30 or 40 series GPU and at least eight gigabytes of VRAM. This is a demo as well, not a finished product. So if you if you want uh, ease of use and a slick user interface, don't do this. But if you're okay tooling around with stuff uh, a little bit, it installs a web server. Don't worry, it's not actually going to connect out to the internet. It's just using it to give you the information and an instance of Python and can use either the Mistral or Llama 2 models to query the data you feed it. NVIDIA's Tensor cores on those RTX GPUs are the things that speed it all up. The app itself is 40 gigabytes. The Python instance takes up three gigabytes of RAM, and it creates a JSON file in every folder you ask it to index. So, you know, don't go crazy and ask it to do your entire drive. Uh, NVIDIA says you probably need about 50 to 100 gigabytes of space free on your hard drive. And that web server, like I said, it does not send your data to the web, but it does mean you use a browser to access the interface. And output is given to the command line. So you'll also need that running. Uh, this really is a demo. Uh, you can feed it text documents, PDF documents, dot .docs, dot .docx, and XML, as well as YouTube URLs, if you wanted to do like a transcript or summary or something. Uh, it does not remember context. So each query is fresh. You can't say something that refers to the previous query. Uh, and NVIDIA says it does better at answering questions uh, than it does at summarizing. It also does better with larger amounts of data than single documents. Uh, very, very much a demo, Sarah, but kind of a, a, a cool demo in that it's showing that you could have a lot of the features of these larger uh, LLMs, these larger large locally. language models. Uh, yeah, yeah, locally on your own machine. I guess, as you were explaining this, saying like, yeah, if you're a person who likes to tinker, and I know a lot of you out there are, uh, this sounds just sort of like fun to do just to do it but it does sound pretty rough around the edges yeah, i yeah. also I, you know i guess uh one of the things and and i get asked this question a lot and some of some folks out there either are asking that themselves or maybe know somebody who who is going to ask them this later is how how important is it when something is uh, run locally versus in the cloud, especially when we're talking about, you know, a language model. Yeah, it's it's one of those questions that's easy to answer from the trust no one side of things, but right. it gets a little fuzzy when it's like, but how much do I really need to worry? Uh, so if you are someone who's like, hey, I want to make sure I don't accidentally give any kind of information to anybody who wouldn't use it. Well, having it all locally means it's under your control. If you do send things to the cloud, like with ChatGPT or Copilot or Gemini, uh, you are relying on that cloud service provider, OpenAI, Microsoft, or Google, mm -hmm. to maintain good stewardship of your data, uh, not only keeping it out of the hands of people who might try to get it from them, but also uh, you know, not using it themselves for something you don't want to use it for. So I guess it, it, it's all an individual choice. How concerned are you about your data being used for things like training models, which OpenAI says uh, ChatGPT does all the time, unless you're an enterprise user, uh, and how much you trust those companies to keep that data to themselves. Also, the whole not remembering context, again, totally depends on you know where you fall on uh, you know privacy versus, I don't know, how context can, can help your next query, but it feels so limited in this yeah. sense. I feel like that's something that the next version of this will include. They just are trying to keep it simple. Uh, Cause again, you're running it locally. You're not yeah. using a big old data center. Uh, so, uh, you know, once you add context, chat GPT used to not remember context and it was a big deal when they added context to it. So it, it's more, it's just more process intensive for it to do that. Uh, which is again, but to your point, another reason why this is just a demo, right? Yeah. Well, if anybody uh, does end up playing around with this, uh, let us know uh, how it works. And um, yeah, it's yeah. not that tinkery. 
like there, it's not like you have yeah, to go and do yeah. registry hacking or anything. It's just not right. user friendly out of the box, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, when, when I hear sort of like web server, but not really a web server command line, you know, I know some yeah. people are like, eh, talk to me later. Web okay. server can sound scary, but yeah. you have all kinds of web servers on your machine right now. You don't realize it because nobody called them out. It just, the only reason to know it's a web server is that you're going to have to use a browser to access it. It doesn't have its own independent GUI, um, which, you know, fine. That, <clears throat> that, there's a lot of stuff like that, mostly websites. A uh, little further context on this too, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang uh, was talking to the World Government Summit and said that he thinks each country should, quote, codify the language, the data of your culture into your own large language model. Now, obviously, Wong thinks that NVIDIA's localized AI processing is the right hardware for the job. Uh, but this comes right along with the, the news this week that NVIDIA stock got to the point where it was slightly uh, ahead of Amazon in market cap uh, briefly, and then it fell behind. But it's pretty much even with Amazon, which makes it the fourth or fifth largest tech company, the fourth or fifth largest company uh, in the world behind Microsoft, Apple, uh, and Alphabet. So we're going to talk with Scott Johnson a little more in part two of this conversation tomorrow about how did that GPU maker that only gamers cared about uh, suddenly turn into the fifth largest company in the world and and the leader in AI hardware? Um, well, another company that uh, some folks around the world are familiar with, Google, uh, has a feature called Google Meet uh, that many people who are part of meetings are well aware of. Google Meet introduced a new companion mode, which is designed to better help participate in video conferences. Companion mode actually already existed, but they've just furthered it, I guess, because enough people were using it. Even when you're in a conference room. So you could be remote, you could be in the conference room, but companion mode will allow you as a user to check in on a mobile device, share something like an emoji reaction but without having to interrupt the speaker, maybe raise your hand uh, virtually to indicate that you'd like to speak, turn on captions, send chat messages, kind of just be in the conference room, but without being sort of too disruptive to the conference room uh, and view and zoom on any presented content to follow along on their device as well. Companion mode has been available on the mobile web version of Google Meet as well as Google's Nest Hub Max device. Now it's available as its own dedicated app for iOS and Android. And Tom, before, before the show started, we were kind of going back and forth where you were like, so this is for people within the conference room, right? Yes, but you don't have to actually physically be in the same room as everyone else in the conference room because, of course, as many of us, uh, either who are remote workers or some form of hybrid work, know very well that doesn't happen as much as it used to. Yeah, so so a little bit of the I looked into a little bit of the history of companion mode. If people aren't familiar with it, uh, they launched it like like Sarah said originally for laptops, uh, for the mobile web, uh, and the Nest Hub Max as a way for people who were in the conference room, but like part of the meeting was not, part of the meeting was remote. Uh, you couldn't do any of the other stuff, right? Because there was one device connecting you to the meeting uh, and your only other option would be to get into the meeting yourself, but then you'd have to turn off your camera, mute yourself, right. uh, and you'd still see all the tiles and all of that. Mm -hmm. So what companion mode does is say, hey, if you don't need voice, video, uh, video or to see everybody, uh, just turn on companion mode. Then you won't be you know, distracted with all of that stuff. You won't have to remember to mute yourself or anything like that, but you'll still be able to raise your hand and see the chat and, and all of that sort of thing. Uh, so if you're using companion mode, you won't see anyone else in the meeting. Uh, you won't hear anyone else in the meeting. They won't hear you, but you will be able to do all of those interactive things. And the news here today, like, like Sarah said, is that uh, instead of having to open a laptop to do that in a meeting, now you can do it on your phone, which is a little, little, little less bulky right? If you're sitting in that conference room to be able to just pull out the phone and be like, okay, now I can, you know, send smiley emojis to my boss while they're talking. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and I, mean, I mean, I don't know. It depends on how much you like your boss, I guess. But I, I do find this, first of all, thank you. Uh, that, that was a, 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 um, a, a good explanation, but there was a time not that long ago. Uh, well, I guess it was sort of a long time ago when I was actually 
physically in a conference room regularly to be part of a meeting. But uh, when I was to kind of like be like looking at my phone, you know, yeah, sort right. Of, you know, pressing a couple buttons here and there, like people would be like, "What is she doing?" Like, <laughs> super rude. She's obviously distracted. Uh, th- these are. I don't know. I mean, this is the modern era uh, era of meetings. So, you know, some people uh, love meetings, some people don't. But if you have to be part of a meeting, you're not always going to be, yeah, running the meeting, being the the main speaker. You might, um, it's it's not really that different than just being like, I'm on mute, but, you know, I'm listening kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, if you happen to be, uh, you know, in your car, maybe you're coming back from a doctor's appointment, whatever you're doing. Uh, a lot of people just aren't in the same room anymore. But if you are, uh, this just uh, allows you to, I guess, be a little less checked out. Yeah. That's yeah. that's kind of what I see this as. Well, cuz you know, I imagine a lot of people have run into this where they're like, "Well, I need I need to put this in the chat room, but now I have to reach over to the Google Nest Max and like type yeah. into it." No, I'm not going to do that. So I guess I'll open my laptop, but then I have to remember to mute and all of that. So companion mode solved a lot of that. And what the mobile one does, I think is funny, but I imagine this is something people really run into uh is, "Hey, if you don't have room to open your laptop, you're in a small conference room, right? And you're like shoved in there. Might be a little uncomfortable." to pull that laptop now you can do it on your phone um so yeah all of this all of this underlines right that hybrid meetings are here to stay like we, their, their companies are developing these features because everyone's doing hybrid meetings yeah i mean when i when i was looking at the story earlier today i was like is this even really that important i mean for a lot of people people be like companion mode i don't i don't care about that you know or i don't have enough meetings to care about that or you know whatever but uh it all just illustrates how much these little little tweaks little tweaks to make it easier to be part of a group while, uh, you know, not necessarily all being in the same room or just not necessarily all having the same equipment or having to participate in the same way is just, you know, it's an evolution. Must be between four and 25 letters in our uh, Twitch chat says, oh, good. I can keep playing Candy Crush, but look like I'm paying attention to the meeting chat. Just just have to be able Th- to switch thanks, between apps Google. real fast. Thanks, yeah. Google. We see you. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just, I'm, yeah, no, I'm, I'm paying attention. I'm, if I'm, you want to share your favorite meeting hacks, uh, let us know <laughs> on the socials. You can get in touch with us at DTNS show on X, uh, at DTNS show at mstdn.social on Mastodon, at Daily Daily Tech News Show on TikTok and DTNS Picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram and Threads. See you there. So TechCrunch had an article today that caught my eye on an app called Memorizer. Now, not every time TechCrunch or The Verge or anybody does an an app review uh, does it make the news, but I thought there was something really interesting about this one. Memorizer is an iOS app. Uh, that's kind of part Goodreads, part Tracked, uh, and part Yelp or 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 uh, Foursquare. Uh, it offers to let you track anything: books, movies, shows, video games, restaurants, recipes, etc. Uh, as memories, uh, memories can be things you did, uh, like a movie you saw, things you're doing. So you can you can check into reading a book and say it's ongoing, uh, or it could be a thing you want to do. It's like you know what I want to go to that restaurant. I'm gonna gonna put that as a memory so I remember what restaurant I want to go to. Memories can be public or private, although you got to pay for the premium to get the private. Uh, and you can follow people's public memories in the Inspirations tab and add some of their memories as recommendations you want to follow up on. It also has groups uh, that you can recommend to each other, so groups are around like sci-fi books or, you know, action movies. Users can create lists of their favorite things, another premium feature. Uh, You could make like best movies of 2023, best restaurants in Austin, something like that. And these are the other interesting aspects of Memorizer that I thought made it worth talking about. There is no recommendation algorithm. There's AI all over this thing, but the AI is in your memory to help flesh it out, you know, to bring in, like, if you put a movie, it'll like bring in summaries and directors and enrich, as they say, your memory, but they don't use AI for recommendations. Recommendations are made for you from people, you know, people you're following or groups you're a member of, and there's no ads. Company makes its money on these premium subscriptions I was talking about that lets you make your memories private, create more customers. Custom lists, etc. 
So Sarah, it's kind of a social network built around is interests rather than yeah. news or viral hits. No. Um, but it's still kind of for influencers, right? Because you know, you're influencing people with your recommendations and stuff. I guess. Yeah. I mean, if, if you really wanted to go all in on memorizer, you could influence lots of people. I, my, my first reaction was like, um, didn't we stop? <laughs> didn't we, didn't we all decide to stop like overthinking every little thing we do throughout, you know, each a day of our life type thing, write it down, send it to somebody type thing. But I think that uh, in in past cases where, it, you know, and you mentioned Foursquare, you know, is it, I, I got no problem with Foursquare or Yelp um, or Path or, you know, any of the apps that I used to use a lot more um, uh, back in the day. But this does feel sort of throwbacky. But uh, I downloaded it. Uh, I installed it uh, earlier today. Uh, played around with it. You know, just, just like, I think you should leave. One of my favorite TV shows. You know, I added that in there. I was like super easy comes up nice graphics you know and it sort of you know it, it lets me quickly add like a note of you know why i like it type thing i already know that i like the show but let's say i just saw it last night type thing um sometimes there is a little context like oh tom and roger and i were remember you know it was it was that monday when we all hung out and had pizza and and watched the show that we all liked little things like that um, kind of breadcrummy stuff that I think it, it, my first reaction was like, it sort of reminds me of if you wake up from a dream and you're like, wow, that was a crazy dream. But if you don't write it down right away, there's a lot of context that just gets lost. Even if you think like in 10 hours, I'll still remember all of this. You just yeah, never do. You yeah. You just don't, or you don't care anymore, but you might wish that you cared later, you know, in a week or a month or a year when you go back to it. I, I like this. I I like stuff like I you know the 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 sort of minutia of things I like and why and where and how. Um, this is this is a great app. Yeah, I I I think it's different than Foursquare uh, and and the others. Not just because it combines multiple things. I think that that is key. It's not saying it's a restaurant app. It's like it's for following things, whatever they are, but also lets you keep those private. Like it makes that front and center. I'm sure you could do private things before in Foursquare and Yelp and others, but they didn't really want you to. The point of Facebook and Twitter and Foursquare was like, share it with the world. What's interesting is this is like, share it with people you want to share it with. You can yeah. share it with the public. You can keep it private. You can have a private group where you only invite certain people. And then what's shared in that group is, so there's more of a balance between, yeah, there might be some things you're comfortable like letting the world know, but let's not just assume that you want to always it's let not, the world know yeah, everything. Yeah, this doesn't strike me as a place to like blast out like, hey, everybody, here's what I just did, um, which mm -hmm. is why I mentioned Path, <laughs> Path for anybody who isn't familiar, um, which, uh, it, uh, gosh, I don't know, Path's heyday was... 2010, 2011, but yeah. uh, it was it was a great app. But the whole idea was like, you know what, social networks are fine, but what about the stuff you really care about? You only really want to share that stuff with your close knit friends. So mm -hmm. you know, pick those ten to thirty people, and that's a different conversation than what you might be having on Twitter. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I I I always liked that idea. I, I think there's room for both of these things. And also for, you know, for example, okay. So I, I mentioned on the show last week when we were talking to Scott Johnson that I watched a clockwork orange after many, many years uh, and, you know, was horrified all over again. So I, I looked it up and it's like, all right, what's the, what's the thing that you want to remember for yourself um, that then I could share with you, Tom, uh, mm -hmm. I can rate the memory you know, mm -hmm. between one and 10, like, is this a really bad memory? Maybe that's important. It doesn't have to be something that you love. It's like, sure. this is a thing. This is an I experience. I watched this and I need to remember I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Or, you know, if someone asks later, <laughs> Sarah, Requiem for a Dream, should I watch that with my grandma? I'd say, heck no, don't do it. <laughs> Uh, yeah. but, but, you know. the grandma, I suppose, but probably in most cases. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe if I didn't have memorizer, I'd be like, oh, maybe I don't, I don't yeah. remember that movie very well. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I like stuff like this. I think it's like it, you, it can be as interesting as you want it to be. 
I think the key thing that caught my eye, though, is that it is a different approach to what seems like the same sort of thing. Uh, but it's saying uh, we're going to use AI. I mean, it's memorize.ai, but we're not going to use an algorithm to make recommendations. We think those are better from people. That you're you're not you're not going to be subject to weird algorithmic fluctuations that way. And in fact, it's a social network, but it's not like Facebook and Twitter have been in the past, which is everybody follow everyone because that leads to chaos. What we want is people yeah. following other folks with similar interests, like on Reddit, because that seems to work a little better. Uh, so it's combining a lot of these different things that we've started to identify as working better in these spaces. Uh, not to mention, it's not ad supported. So it is not selling your privacy. It's asking you to pay for the privacy. Now, that might rub you the wrong way, but then you don't have to use the app at all. Right. But I think it is fair for them to say like, hey, if you want to maintain uh, the best version of the app, you should pay it, pay us for it. And we'll give you some of the stuff uh, for free. Uh, subscriptions are $6 a month, $45 for a year. Um, so it's, you know, it's not outrageous. That might be more than you want to pay for something like this, but it depends on how useful it is. One thing they note is that, uh, they have 70,000 monthly active users and 50% of new users keep using the app after three months, which is an insanely high retention for apps. People download op apps all the time and never go back to them. Uh, so this one is, is holding on to its users a, a lot longer than others. All right, let's check out the mailbag. This one comes from Technomensch, uh, who said, Tom mentioned, uh, this was on Monday show, I believe, that he has an external Blu-ray drive that works with his Mac. Technomensch says, I have yet to find one that does. My old external DVD drive was a micro USB to USB-A, used to work on the Intel Macs until I upgraded to a newer model. That wasn't supported. It's been gathering dust ever since. Is your drive USB-C, or are you using a hub with USB-A support? What have you found that works? Um, my drive is USB-C. I still can't tell you what it is because I can't find it, which is, uh, I think, a revelation into how often we use it. Uh, uh, so <laughs> I, I, will f I will dig that up as soon as I can. Uh, but Roger came up with uh, an OWC link at maxsales.com uh, with Blu-ray drives, both internal and, and external. Uh, if you want ones that definitely work, uh, with Mac. Uh, and if anybody else has recommendations for Technomunch of like, oh yeah, this is my external Blu-ray drive. Uh, I use it. I love it. Um, and especially I think if it works with USB-A, because I think that's one of Technomunch's uh, situations as well, uh, send it to us. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Patrons, stick around for the extended show. We've got more good content for you on Good Day Internet. Uh, you may have seen the story that the on-demand version of the Super Bowl halftime show fixed a few audio issues, like a cracking note and some low mic volume, uh, so that you wouldn't know they happened live. Is this smart? Is this ethical? Does this bother us? Stick around and find out. Just a reminder, we do the show live. You can catch it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back tomorrow talking about how NVIDIA pivoted from gaming to AI with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. The DTNS Family of Podcasts. Helping each other understand. Simon Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>